Um, hello, my name is Jonathan Fisher. We're talking about migration IO2 to the cloud. If you're here to figure out how to migrate IO2 to the cloud, I'm sorry, this talk is not for you. This is me trying to convince you why IoT devices should be in the cloud. Great, so who is this guy talking to me? Who's this guy up on the stage? Hello, I'm Jonathan Fisher. I'm a staff security en engineer at Praetorian. Um, we do a few offensive security services. This list is not a sell for the company. This is, um, we do a lot of things, web, mobile, cloud, IoT, red teaming. Purple is an interesting exercise where we're inside the network. We do commands and we see if they can detect our commands. External, we look at all from an outside perspective, any um, assets that we could see or exploit. Um, both of those are the offensive security. Um, the reason why I have this up here is because I have personally done all of these services, um, but we also do blue team-esque services uh, around threat modeling, secure development lifecycle, the NIST cybersecurity framework, and other things like IR and threat hunting exercises. So the company does quite a bit. Um, I've been here for about four and a half years. Uh, our engagements last from anywhere from one to three weeks. What that translates to is I've done about 100 engagements, which, which is a lot. Um, I'm definitely not a expert on everything, but I've seen a lot. Uh, so I also have an OSCPT, oh, sorry, OSCP certificate, well known in the ECPTX, which is a red team specific cert. Um, but you know what? I could care less about all that stuff. What I actually care about is my wife, <laughs> my cute dog, look at him with the ball. And then I also have a kid on the way, which I am super stoked for. Great. So you aren't here to hear about me. What are you here for? Uh, we'll be going through an overview of IoT security, the IoT cloud components that's actually relevant um, for IoT, and then also uh, IoT used in AWS, Azure, and GCP. We'll also have time for Q&A uh, afterwards. So uh, don't be alarmed if this page scares you. So this is at engineering alphabet soup. Um, when it comes to Internet of Things, that's what IoT stands for. Security also often consists of many different components. And uh, you can think of a device, for an example, let's take a uh, smart robot vacuum. Um, you take it apart, there's hardware components inside of it. Um, there's PCBs, those PCBs may have debug ports I could connect to. Um, it may have some serial communications to other chips on the board. That's all interesting to test. There may be some external I.O. interfaces that could be as something like an SD card or USB interface uh, and also memory on the device itself. Um, and so there's a few common ones like EEPROM, SPY Flash, EMMC, which is an embedded SD card, and then um, secure enclaves like a TPM. Um, another common attack surface for IoT is the firmware and software. And I kind of join them together because often when people think about um, the firmware of a device, they typically think about embedded firmware. Uh, what that means is um, it's just machine ran code on the device where software, you can have just portions of the software updated without having the whole firmware updated. Um, so things we care about there is input handling, business logic, so software updates. Um, you can talk about the Linux, if it's running a Linux OS, the security of the Linux software uh, and the secure boot functionalities. Other things on IoT security uh, is the wireless connectivity, also internet connectivity. So Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee. Um, and then finally, <laughs> that's all device. Uh, finally, what we're actually going to be focusing on is this last little sliver of it, um, internet communications. So for example, HTTPS, MQTT is a really common publish subscribe protocol. So this is um, used whenever you have multiple devices that want to subscribe and publish events. Um, and they want to do it in a way that um, is easily managed through this method broker. And the communicate is called MQTT. So that's IoT security at a broad level. So as we do security assessments, um, what I typically do is test these devices. However, IoT security is not just about the device. It's actually about the whole ecosystem. So IoT should never just be only focused on the device. Yes, that is the majority of how we test the devices, but it should also include not just the devices, but its mobile applications and its API services and cloud integrations. So uh, what are common IoT setups? Uh, two common ones is where the device connects directly to the internet, uh, often provisioned by mobile app. And this example, I have another uh, uh, iRobot Roomba uh, as an example of this IoT setup that's very popular. 
Uh, another way is you have a device that connects to a gateway, and that gateway is what connects to the internet. Um, what you can think about this is for a Google um, hub, a uh, home hub, we have these lights. Um, that's not going to talk directly through Wi-Fi. It's going to talk through a low, uh, a low range bandwidth with the hub, and then the hub is what connects to the internet. So uh, what are the things we actually care about from an IoT security perspective on the focus of internet communications? Uh, Number one is communication channels. So the way that the device connects to the internet, that channel is very important to secure. Typically what we look for is for secure TLS connections. Um, that makes sure that data is encrypted um, and is unable to be man the middle um, sufficiently during transit. Another thing we care about is the authentication and authorization of the device. How the device handles and receives input. This could lead to things like injection attacks and denial of service of the device itself or of the internet um, service that it's connecting to. Um, that's still just really general. Any of the OWASP top 10 would still apply to this internet connectivity. Other things that are specific to IoT is the provisioning. So this is how a device initially connects to the internet. Um, that's not completely true. Provisioning could also be done um, out of band. So it could be done during manufacturing, but for IoT devices, especially consumer home devices, there is this provisioning step with like a mobile application or some sort of manual process. Another thing that's really interesting is the firmware and software updates. How a device securely receives and updates its own firmware and software is incredibly important. So if we can mantle in the middle this firmware update process, we could possibly get bad code on the device and then have control of that device. Um, another thing that's really interesting is device logging. So if we have device logs, we could possibly um, see how often the device is connected um, and could lead to indicators if there's any sort of exploit against that device. Great. Migrating to cloud. So this is kind of the focus of the talk. Why cloud platforms? Why, why even do cloud platforms to begin with? Um, you don't need the cloud. You just need some sort of internet connectivity to call IoT. Internet of Things. We don't need cloud. Um, however, cloud is the future for IoT. Why? First thing is scale. So IoT fleets can be 100,000 plus devices all out on um, the world. And so how do you manage these things? Um, if you have your own services, you have to make sure all of this can have availability concerns, all sorts of load balancing, that nothing breaks, it becomes very important. Cloud helps alleviate that scale. Public key infrastructure. So how a device authenticates and authorizes to the internet, um, the best solution is public key infrastructure. And that is really hard to, to do if you already have devices out on the field that do not have PKI already installed onto the devices. Uh, the way forward is to have PKI systems. Um, and thankfully, cloud providers already provide this um, from, the, from the box. Also, what's really nice about cloud is that they already provide this logging and monitoring aspect of IoT security that we want to have. Other big benefits is that the cloud can integrate with other cloud resources. So if you have um, some sort of um, EC2 or Lambda service that goes to the internet, you could have some sort of API endpoint that then updates information to the device that's connected to the cloud. Very seamless. You don't actually have to write a lot of services. You can do everything in your own cloud provider. There's also a nice defined registration process. What you find is how a device registers itself. There's many, many different ways you can do this. And it gets very confusing fast because if you don't do it right, you can have vulnerabilities. Another big thing is access controls. So once a device is connected, what should it be able to do? Should it be able to publish to anything or say, hey, I want to talk to this device? Maybe, or maybe not. So cloud allows us to have this access controls. Other things are vendor special features, and we'll see a few of those in um, AWS, Azure, and GCP. So before I get to the vendors, uh, we do need some high-level concepts of IoT core features. None of the cloud providers even goes this basic of um, the cloud components, but this is kind of abstracted, um, in my belief, what you should care about. Number one is registration, how a device gets registered to the cloud. We've already talked about this can be out of band during manufacturing. This can also be done, um, pre-done in the cloud itself. 
So this goes hand in hand with device identity. So inside the cloud, you can generate certificates. And then after you generate those certificates in the cloud, you can place them onto the device during manufacturing. And so that's all part of this registration and device identity components that allow some sort of trust between the device and the internet. Another core component is message bus, how the device actually communicates with the cloud. Um, the most common message bus is MQTT, which is what we talked about earlier, which is that publish and subscribe message protocol. Another big component is data routing. So once the device is talking with the cloud, where does that data go? Um, does the cloud network pass it to its own services? Does it send it somewhere else? Um, all cloud providers have this aspect of data routing. And then last is this logging and monitoring of device events should be logged and monitored. Great. There are multiple different cloud IoT vendors, um, but I did just want to focus on the big three name, big names, um, AWS, Azure, and GCP. So for AWS, it's called AWS IoT Core. It was the first one to get released. It was released in 2015, then quickly followed by Azure IoT Hub released in 2016. And it wasn't until two years later that GCP had its own IoT Core um, service that was released. And so as you can see, this is all sub um, 10 years. Uh, the GCP is less than five years old. So this is all new. And as these pushes happen, um, you'll see more and more vendors start pushing to the cloud. Other notab notable missions, IBM, Cisco, Salesforce, things work. Uh, there's a bunch more than just these three cloud providers, but they all do those core components right here. They will all do the registration, identity, message bus, data routing, and logging. Okay, so here is the fun part of the talk, AWS IoT Core. Uh, this is a screenshot of the panel. And as you can see, uh, that has uh, the thing called a thing. So it's, a, it's an older platform. And what's consistent with AWS is they have weird, confusing naming conventions. Um, so if anyone who's used AWS, all their services are these random names and the names don't tell you anything about what the service does. Uh, so similar, in IoT land, uh, I wouldn't expect anything different, but devices are called things. This has funny conversations when you say, hey, I need to protect your thing. Um, and then uh, you're like, all right, what thing are you talking about? Like, oh, well, the thing in your IoT hub, uh, that thing. Um, so uh, you can also use templates for fleet provisioning. This is a really cool technology. Uh, so you see underneath this manage column, there's this fleet hub. You can create templates that all devices should have the same um, kind of device state or information about the device, and you can do it during manufacturing. And so this fleet provisioning is very, very powerful uh, from AWS, and you can uh, very quickly get devices in the correct state by using this fleet hub. Also, device identities are handled through X509 certificates. Um, these are very nice to have because it already has this trusted CA that is signed and uh, by AWS itself. Um, but you can see on the left here, there's a bunch of these weird names. So you got green grass, I'm like, what is that? Um, this wireless connectivity, you have the secure, defend, act, and test. And uh, it is a big steep learning curve. That's one of the key takeaways I want you to have about AWS. Um, I know in the past four months, they've actually changed this view. Um, and so this is actually probably a bad screenshot to use, but it is just to say this stuff is moving and it's always changing. So it does take knowledge about the services to even kind of get started, which is unfortunate. Um, other things about AWS IoT Core is it provides ways for users to create their own access controls. Um, so this is unique to AWS. Um, Azure and GCP does not allow you to do this, but it is very flexible. On the downside, you can actually expose security holes by creating bad access policies. So on the right, what we have is this access policy. It's in JSON. And so it has two statements. Um, one is an allow, an IoT connect action. And that resource is the thing name. And so that allows any device to connect, which makes sense. You want devices to connect. What's the next effect, next statement? It's an action, subscribe, or receive data. You're allowing that. But the resource is this thing slash start. And for MQTT communications, this means it can talk to any device, anything. Um, 
And so what that is really bad is that if a device is connected, they can actually receive and see any other device update information. So if you have any sort of like privilege updates or information, um, this would be a vulnerability that they're not aware that they're exposing. Kind of the worst example, we have seen this and, and exploited it, is where you have an allow publish action to firmware update topics from any device. So that means any device, if you compromise it, obtain a certificate, connect to AWS, you could actually say, hey, every device, here's where you should update your firmware. And I'm going to give you the URL of where to do that. And I can put whatever I want in there. Um, and if the device does not properly validate that firmware update, uh, you can then compromise you know, hundreds of thousands of devices from one device. This is where these things can be very dangerous if you don't do it right. Um, other things about AWS is that it's message buses over MQTT. Remember, that's the most common protocol. Um, if you don't want to use MQTT, you can use HTTPS only through publishes messages you can't subscribe. Um, and then you can also do MQTT through WebSockets, which is nice. Um, data routing occurs in the ACT section. So previously, as you can see, at the kind of towards bottom, there's this defend ACT test. It's not really clear what ACT does. Uh, you have to know what it does. You have to go into it and see what the functionality is. But in this case, ACT section, it allows data routes um, to go to different places. So you can have an ACT rule where if you see this particular topic, you can pass it to um, AWS DynamoDB. So that example is the device is saying, hey, I want to update my information. Let's say I'm a robot. I want to update my state. I am now vacuuming. And so I'm going to publish that information to the cloud. And the cloud is just going to update a database in AWS DynamoDB. That stuff is very powerful. You don't have to write a lot of code to make that happen. Um, also, what's really nice about AWS IoT Core is that they also have these kind of new features that are really premium. So green grass, like we said earlier, what the heck is that? Um, green grass is a way to kind of manage uh, these things through a seamless process. So you can kind of do graph queries, or not graph queries, just graphs where you can take a Lambda function, go to this meshes route. Um, it allows you to, to um, manage these IoT fleets through a very programmatic way directly in AWS. Other things is device defender. Um, what you can do with device defender is really powerful. Once it's submitting events to the device, you can have monitoring detections and you can have a device profile to be able to pick up an alert if something isn't happening as expected. So if a device is not behaving as expected, you can actually alert on that. Really cool. Um, last is that low range WAN. Uh, this is useful if you want to be able to do um, that device to gateway to internet setup. So if you have all these um, long range uh, wired area networks that have this mesh network to the gateway, um, AWS does provide solutions to do it through a more secure way through their own PKI. Um, so it's just cool technology. Great. So that is AWS. Let's do a quick switch to Azure. So uh, Azure has feature rich, feature rich IoT platform, but it can be expensive. So this is also typical of Azure land. So like we said in the last bit, AWS has weird naming conventions. Typically, Azure can sometimes be very expensive. Depends on how many services you have. Um, they have a little bit more flexibility about the types of devices they support. So it can support three different types of authentication, symmetric key, self-signed certificates, and CA signed certificates. Um, those first two, symmetric key and self-signed, those are important to make sure you get those right. If you have problems where you leak the symmetric key for a device, then you can run into that same situation where you can authenticate as a device you're not supposed to be able to authenticate as. Other things about Azure IoT Hub is they have this kind of strong push on this premium IoT Edge device type. And so the Edge is complicated because what you can do with an Edge is you can put uh, local Azure services onto the device itself. It's a very interesting technology. Um, also, what's really cool is edge devices can also act as a gateway. Um, and you can kind of configure per need basis on what kind of device the edge is supposed to be. Um, this is why they've kind of centered around this edge premium device. The downside is it's just expensive to use. They are also really good at message routing. So they have very flexible uh, message routes. You can send it to Event Hub, Service Bus Queues or Topics, Storage, these are all Azure services, um, very similar to AWS where you could pass it 
through that act management inside Azure is way more uh, simple and you can easily see what it's doing. It also has the most flexible message bus. So it doesn't just only have MQTT and HTTPS, it also has another service called AMQP. Um, and so it's another type of publish describe message broker, um, but it's a little bit more flexible in the way it uh, handles data. So takeaways there is that it has a lot of options. Azure cares a lot about its products and they want to have a lot of features. Other premium features is Microsoft Defender. This is very similar to um, Azure, uh, AWS where you have these device profiles that will alert and monitor based off of um, incorrect behaving devices. Um, and so this is their own uh, kind of way to have um, visibility on their edge. This is also an edge device specific thing. So another reason why they want everyone to use their um, IoT edge devices. Last one, last but not least, is GCP IoT Core. Uh, this is a simple and clean. So if you want to say, I don't want to know anything about these services, I just want it to, to work. Um, GCP is your friend. So if you can look on the right, um, it only has four little paints. So if we look back, look at all that mess. One, two more back, that's also a bunch of mess. Um, we go back to GCP. There's only four things, registry details, devices, gateways, and monitoring. Very simple, very clean. Um, it does authenticate a little bit differently. It authenticates um, RSA or X509 search, but they authenticate with JWT. Um, that is a particular way to authenticate using JSON web tokens, um, but the same idea where you sign data with something that you own. It also has simple gateway devices. Um, so in the AWS world, you had that premium feature called um, long range WAN. And Azure world, we had this IoT edge that could act as a gateway. GCP is really clean. It just says gateway. You don't have to think about what you're trying to do. It's very clear. Uh, also, what's really nice about GCP is the entire message bus is hidden. We can't control at all uh, what it, what's happening underneath uh, the hood. So um, where AWS had a lot of customized access controls you can have, in GCP, you can't do any of that. It defines what that protocol is, and the only thing it cares about is device updates and reads and writes. So I know it's a little bit hard to see in that text, but underneath that registry ID, we have pub sub topics. Um, PubSub is a special service inside GCP. Um, and so by default, all data is passed to GCP pub, pub, PubSub. And uh, and the right, the topic types, there's default telemetry and default device state. Um, and so those are kind of the two main topics that will happen right out of the box. Okay, that was really fast. I apologize if I spoke too quickly, um, but there are some cool takeaways. IoT security is very complex and it's hard to get it right, um, but cloud platforms help alleviate very big security concerns. One is availability. You just want the device to work and connect to the internet. The cloud helps alleviate so many concerns. Um, authentication authorization. The cloud has PKI built in. If you have certificates downloaded to your device, you're way better than most of the competition because most devices don't use the cloud at all. They have their own custom authentication mechanism. They have their own session key that you can use to authenticate. Um, there's many problems with those types of authentication, but, but PKI helps solve those problems. Um, another big is logging and monitoring. We've already talked about this, but the idea of having device logs, um, you know, it doesn't sound new because we're used to logging, but in the IoT space, it is very new. You don't typically send logs to the internet and they're not monitoring these things. It's a very good thing to have. It's kind of the advance where things are going in the future. Um, and cloud will help do that for you. Uh, things can go wrong if devices are not registered securely or access controls policies are not following best practices. So just because you use IoT in the cloud doesn't mean everything is happy and you have no problems. Um, you do need to have some awareness of what you're doing whenever you're migrating your IoT services to the cloud. Now, I know what you all are asking, which IoT platform is the best? And unfortunately, there's no right answer. Uh, it really depends, uh, go figure, on what services you already have in your network. So if you're a company and you have a bunch of AWS services, odds are you probably want to use AWS for your IoT systems. Um, you know, vice versa, if you're using GCP in-house, 
you probably want to use GCP. Okay. Let's say I'm not that far yet. I'm just interested in getting my IoT devices for some sort of deployment. I just want to do some sort of development prototyping. I want to sell my device to a company. What do I use? Uh, I would say research the cloud platform. Um, there are some interesting technologies in each cloud platform. However, um, each one does have its own pros and cons. Um, so uh, it is good to be smart about it. If you do just want it to work, I would personally suggest GCP. Um, but if you want to actually be in the market and competing against large players, I would probably gravitate towards the AWS or Azure world. Um, but you know, there are proper discussions about this. You can say, you know what, forget those three providers. We're going to use Salesforce Cloud. You know, I like them. So th there are a bunch of cloud buyers. And that is it. I know I am quite early. So we'll have great questions. I hope you'll have some great questions. And we can even ask IoT device specific questions. We say, forget the cloud. How do you hack IoT stuff? I can also help. As per usual, if anybody does have any questions, please line up here at the front and I'll give you a microphone so everybody can hear you. So come on up. I don't, I don't know about him, but I don't. Hi. Uh, yeah, just had a quick question on as far as uh, moving your IT devices, at least uh, from the edge to the cloud. Um, what does that do as far as like reducing attack surface? Um, uh, do any of these platforms have anything on the lines of um, not vulnerability management, but more of like patch management, uh, firmware lifecycle, stuff like that? Um, I know a lot of those are usually done in-house, but do any of these platforms have those type integrations? Yes, yes, they do. So uh, great question. Thank you. Uh, Azure is probably the most forward thinking on that. So one of their premium features of their IoT Edge devices is you have built-in firmware update protocols. And so it'll do the firmware updates. It'll validate the signature, which is very important. So all of those protections are already built in for Azure. Um, there are you know, other things to worry about from a platform pers perspective. So you know, if you are storing device data on S3 bucket, you know, you have possible exposed S3 buckets. So every cloud provider also has their own security concerns, you know, to think about. Um, and I can speak more to those if you're, if you're curious of what those are, but, but yes, it, you don't, um, you, you still have the baggage of whatever provider you choose um, to make sure there's no additional security exposure. Okay, um, I do a lot of IoT stuff myself. Um, I'm concerned because I've got all my devices, you know, sitting in the house, communicating up to the cloud and everything else. Uh, what do you recommend on, you know, securing your local network from the standpoint of those same devices that are reaching out to all the cloud environments? Yeah, okay. that's a great question. Uh, so my answer is probably not what most people do. Um, but what I typically do is I place all of my connected devices, that's not my phone or my laptop, on its own subnet. Um, what that means is that um, the devices cannot communicate with one another. I just expect that my IoT device is already hacked. You know, like I, I should have zero confidence that someone's not already on my device. The question is, do you do you really care? Like I, I have a smart vacuum at my house. Like, do I really care if it gets hacked? Maybe like then I'll just disconnect from the internet, you know, like the uh, possibly, you know, <laughs> you know, but if it's more concerning things like a, you know, baby monitor where people really care about, you know, the securing of their, of their child, um, you know, you, you could be even more particular about it. But the way I go about it is I just place all of my devices that are not my primary, like my phone, my laptop on their own subnet. And I just let them talk to each other and do everything else. So you mentioned that AWS has a steeper learning curve. Mm -hmm. um, they, 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 they often they'll have pretty kind of good training. Yes. Um, so if someone really was agnostic as to which one, but they wanted to kind of get learning on IoT uh, cloud security, would uh, do you, do you have an advice or could you give insight as to maybe which Microsoft versus uh, Azure has better kind of training? Um, uh, support? Yeah, that's a great question. Unfortunately, I probably don't have the best answer. The way I've even learned about all of these services was by doing assessments 
on these devices and where they would use different cloud providers. Um, and so I never came from this as a zero knowledge type person, but I would imagine that all providers have some sort of documentation. I know AWS typically has better documentation of their services, but you still have to get behind the idea of like, what does device registration mean? Like, what is it really doing here? You need to have some sort of understanding of PKI, like what is the device actually connecting with? How is it creating some sort of message structure? In AWS, there's a lot of stuff that you can customize. And it can be very overwhelming. Um, I, I would personally say like GCP is the easiest learning curve. Um, Azure is also good, but sometimes your docs aren't the best. Um, so, uh, Hi, Robert. Um, my question is more like towards um, asset discovery for IoT stuff. <laughs> um, big organizations, um, the hardest part of IoT is figuring out what you have. Right. Right. So in your experience, what is like the most efficient way to discover IoT devices? Um, is it like it's going for the best, most affordable, like third party asset discovery thing? Or uh, what has your experience been with like in, in big organizations trying to find like, you know, cameras or smartphones or smartwatches that connect to your network? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So uh, again, I'm coming from a different perspective because this is after the fact that customers come to us to ask us to break into their things. And so it's very particular about what product we're testing. Um, we're not really inside a, a client network where we're trying to see all their, their devices. So I would go towards the af asset discovery um, software side. If I was really interested, let's say I'm a big hospital and I have you know, hundreds or maybe possibly thousands of devices, it could be like a printer and I don't know where all of them live. Um, I would go to some sort of software solution. It would not be easy for one person to do that. Um, I believe there's actually one person tabling out there is for phosphorus that does that software. I think they're you know they're a little bit newer, but they have asset discovery and that's their main core cell. I don't know if anyone's from that table who's just like, yes, he talked about me. Yeah. Um, was there anything that we're gonna present that makes the organizing <laughs> no, no. I I had originally planned to have almost demo sessions of each provider. Um, I think that would have been a little confusing. Uh, if I would just been scrolling around each provider and going through all of their features and descriptions, people would have gotten bored very quickly, <laughs> and uh, it just wouldn't have gone as well. Uh, so. Uh, uh, that's probably the piece that would extend this talk where you could be a little bit more specific about some of the things that they do. That's really cool. They're cool technologies. Um, it's cool to know about, uh, but for the aspect of IoT security, they weren't as important. Um, of course, at my job, I do a lot of hacking of things um, and I can't talk about that. So uh, I wish I could, but that is not with b -Sides. That's with my company. Okay, uh, the question was uh, in the conclusions slide, um, what would be the best practices to follow if they don't, if they weren't using cloud? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Well, what are the recommended best practices in the conclusion section? So thankfully, AWS does have some nice uh, documentation about this. If you use the device defender, let's go back to AWS ID core. Oh. Yes, device defender will call out bad policies. So this is why you know they want you to sign up for the services. If you have any sort of bad policies, it'll flag it and it'll tell you why this is bad or something that's alarming. Um, and so this is something to invest in if you want to make sure you don't have bad policies while you're developing this thing. So if, if you don't know what you're doing, it may be a good idea to enable these sorts of services as a catch um, before you start implementing stuff out for production. Uh, for uh, the Azure world where you have kind of that possible exploit the symmetric key, um, the recommendation is to migrate to X509 certificates signed by a CA. Um, that third one is kind of the, the future um, of making sure of some sort of uh, strong route to sign devices. The problem that happens if you already have a thousand fleets you know, out there in the field right now, and they're not using some sort of certificate based authentication, like how do you even start that first step? And so that's why, you know, they have these other options like self-signed CA certificates or a symmetric key 
Um, but the recommendation would just be uh, as you're deploying or building new devices, you migrate to X509 certificates or some sort of certificate-based authentication. But it can be very complex. If someone asks me, um, you know, how do we secure our manufacturing process for device registration? You're like, oh man, like it depends on who's manufacturer. So it, it, everything changes. It's a very pretty complex system. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, is there any public information I can share? Uh, there, there are a few ones. If you go to our website, praetorian.com, uh, we do have a lot of customers and their own testimonies about our products. So uh, one on our uh, website was a Samsung Arctic uh, device that they published. So they were prototyping this new device by Samsung. And we came in and we looked at it and found uh, you know, possible vulnerabilities that they quickly remediated before they went to market with it. So it was, a, it was a nice success story where they had things, we found vulnerabilities, they fixed it, and now they could go to market. Um, other things, one of our biggest customers is Abbott Laboratories, um, which is, you know, they do medical, you probably see them with their COVID tests. You know, we, we, we do a lot of work with them. So you can imagine the type of medical devices we may be testing um, with those sort of products. Yeah, of course. Oh, one more question. Yeah, of course. Uh, the question was, um, there are some uh, documentation for network security and application security, uh, but not really for IoT security. Like, wh where do I get started? Where do I where I get um, first steps? So the question I would have for you would be if you are um, trying to test the IoT device or this kind of cloud communication. So the most IoT security tools and training is around the device itself. Um, there is one particular company we really like called Adify. Um, Adify is a company that does training sessions at Black Hat um, and DEF CON for this IoT uh, hacking type stuff. And they have um, a lab kit that you can buy that includes hardware and it's vulnerable hardware. And you can use the tools of the business to actually break into the device. Um, it is a hard field to get into because you actually have to hack something that's physical and not everyone has access to those devices. Um, other really cool groups I've been a big fan of um, it's the exploit.rs group. They have a bunch of blog posts, also a big DEF CON black hat company. Um, and they have a bunch of really cool exploits where they would go and root something like a you know, Amazon Fire TV, something like that. Of course. Okay. Well, I appreciate y'all's time. Thank you, besides for letting me talk. I appreciate um, your all's involvement and apologize if you are expecting more, <laughs> uh, but hope you have a good time.